Hello again, internet. So uh, I am working on bringing you more uh, universal algebra and lattice theory lectures. But today I thought it would be a good time to try doing something that I've been meaning to do for a while. Um, and so I'm not really sure whether I'm going to keep doing this or it will be uh, just kind of a one-off thing. But uh, if you need a name for what this is going to be, I guess I would say that uh, this is uh, playing with magma. And so the idea here is that I am going to uh, sort of experiment with some small uh, finite algebras in real time. Um, I don't actually have much of a plan. Um, honestly, I'm not just pretending to not have a plan. I really don't have much of a plan. Um, but I guess my intention here is that this is going to be a little slower and more elementary and more chill than um, the, um, well, technically elementary, but still more sophisticated universal algebra lectures that I've been recording um, as formal lectures. And so uh, I hope that um, what I'm doing here will kind of give people an idea of um, what it's like to start experimenting with these things. And um, yeah, I guess, I guess I sort of envision this being like a, a Bob Ross style, like, you know, paint your own picture kind of a deal. I don't think I'm going to be as chill. I'm still going to be a little bit crazed, but that's that's kind of the, the thing I'm hoping for. So um, let me get a new page here. All right, so first of all, um, recall from life or from my lectures or whatever that um, an algebra, A with the underline to indicate the algebra um, is going to be some set along with some uh, indexed sequence of basic operations. But I'm actually going to restrict my attention to a particular type of algebraic structure, which is uh, the one that I, I guess, have the most experience actually fiddling around with manually. And so that would be a magma, which consists of a set a and a single binary operation mapping pairs of things in A to other things in A. And so, of course, uh, we can give some canonical ordering to our set A if it's finite. Um, say that our set A, no, our set A is A1 through a n. So we have n elements in our set. Then we can draw the uh, the Cayley table for this operation f, which determines our magma a, um, where we have rows and columns indexed by the elements of a. And then um, and then, for example, in this spot would be f of a1, a1, and then f of a1, a2, and so forth. And I think I illustrated this in one of my, um, my first uh, videos for the universal algebra lectures. But the, uh, the classic example that I like to do is uh, the rock, paper, scissors magma. where the multiplication here is given by uh, which of the two items wins when those items are thrown in a game of rock, paper, scissors. So rock and rock tie, so rock times rock is rock. Uh, paper beats rock, so rock times paper is paper. And then similarly for these other ones, let's see, and then uh, rock beats scissors. OK, yeah. OK. Um, so we also have uh, 
in addition to this uh, rock, paper, scissors magma, we also have other examples um, like addition. If I do addition mod two, I only need two numbers, which are zero and one. And then zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one, one plus zero is one. And one plus one is two, but two is zero. Uh, if I'm doing addition modulo two or taking the remainder, I mod out by two or when I divide by two. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, we can obtain any magma that we want, um, any finite magma that we want by writing down a table uh, of elements, say A1 through AN, AN, and then um, filling out uh, the entries in this N by N grid, um, where each spot corresponds to a product of two of the AI. So we can fill out this grid however we want, and that will be a magma. So maybe uh, to make things really concrete in case for some, for some uh, fantastic reason you are watching this without having any sort of background in abstract algebra, which I'm not sure that I encourage, but maybe that's really up to you, I suppose. I'm going to be super chill and just leave, leave that up to you, whether you want to subject yourself to this without sufficient mathematical background. <laughs> So let's, uh, let's first of all um, take a step way back and look at magmas of order one. There is only one magma of order one up to isomorphism. And so if we call the, element, the elements of that magma, uh, we call that, um, we call that set, of, set of elements, the set containing A, just the singleton A, then we have a binary operation F, and that operation F, well, it's just given by F of AA is equal to A. This is the only, this is the only magma with a single, with a single element. This is the only possible multiplication that we could have on a set with one element where we have to define what all of the products are. It's this one. So that one's not uh, super crazy um, in many respects. Uh, so that's pretty much it for order one. So for order for order two, uh, we're going to have, say, a set with two elements, which I'll call A and B and the single binary operation F still. And so a magma of order two essentially amounts to filling out this, this grid or this Cayley table where there are four, there are four spots. There are these, these four spots. And if we fill those four spots in with A's or B's, whatever we choose, then we will obtain a magma of order two which again just means that there are two elements in the magma or in the universe of the magma, which is this underlying set. So of course there are more than one, there, there's more than one magma of order two. If we fix our underlying set to be the set AB, there are two choices for the first spot, two for the second, two for the third and two for the fourth. And so there are, uh, two to the two squared, which is two to the four, which is 16 um, possible uh, Cayley tables. So there are 16 possible choices for such a binary multiplication. Of course, some of them will yield magmas which are isomorphic to each other, um, but uh, at least initially, it seems that there are 16, 16 possible um, magmas to choose from if we fix our underlying set to be the set, this particular set with two elements. Um, okay, so sort of an aside, um, 
A nice thing about 16 is that it's two to the fourth, but it's also four squared. And so it's a good number that's of the form uh, x to the y equals y to the x, which I always found particularly pleasing. Okay, so now here's the, uh, here's the slightly interactive part of this. Um, I'm going to choose a particular magma of order two. I'm going to take my magma of order two that I'm looking at right now to be the one uh, to be the one that looks like this. So now I just filled these spots in sort of randomly. Okay, I have some experience, so I might have at least attempted to make a choice, although pretty much anything you do on the set with two elements is going to be pretty nifty. So now what I encourage you to do, if you are actually indeed following along with me here, is that you should write down your own Cayley table like this, but perhaps make different choices for what the entries are here. And so then you will get your own, your own magma, uh, which you may call A or give another letter to if you want to name it something different. And of course, you don't need to use A and B for the names of your elements. If you want to uh, get creative with those, you're um, more than welcome to. It is your, it is your algebra. <laughs> Oh, and I'm going to now denote by capital A the set AB when I'm talking about this magma. Okay, so I'm going to stick to looking at this one for a while. Well, um, hmm. so I guess, I guess the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to look at uh, to look at subuniverses of uh, of my magma here, and so a subuniverse. Um, okay, so maybe I'll write this down. A uh, subuniverse of A is going to be a uh, subset. Um, say X, a subset of the universe of the magma A, so that <clears throat> for any X1 and X2 that are in my, oh, that are in my set X, uh, we have F of X1, X2, um, is itself an element <clears throat> of X. Or in other words, a subuniverse of the magma A is a subset which is closed under the binary multiplication of, of that magma A. Of course, there's a more general definition for more general algebras, but for magmas, this is this is good enough. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see which subsets of my set A are subuniverses of my magma. So if I uh, look at the empty set, then I see that, well, okay. So uh, the only time that I have that I have, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to be a little. I'm going to be a little more. I'm going to be a little more organized first. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop over here, and I'm going to write down my Cayley table. And you, of course, can keep using your Cayley table as well if you're following along at home. Then I'm going to. Uh, first of all, oh yeah, I'm also going to stop writing like things like f of f of x y, and instead I'm just going to write x y next to each other like this to denote multiplication, because that'll make our lives easier. 
So instead of writing f of a, a equals a, I'm just going to write a times a equals a. Okay. Now I'm also going to give myself space so that for each possible subset, empty set, singleton set containing a, singleton set containing b, and the whole set a, which is a b, I'm going to give myself space to check whether each of these is a subuniverse or not. Okay. So remember to check uh, to check whether I have a subuniverse. Means that if x and y, oh, well, I guess I'll stick to the notation I was using before. x1 and x2 are in x, then x1 times x2 is also in x. Well, for the empty subset, if I have x1, x2, in um, in the empty subset, th this is impossible. Um, so this is this is vacuously it is vacuously true if you're familiar with that logical terminology that um, that for all x1 x2 in the empty set x1 times x2 is also in the empty set. So um, okay, so for uh, vacuous reasons. Um, empty set is in what I'm going to call the collection of subuniverses of my magma A. Okay. Okay. So, um, All right, so fine. So no matter which magma you chose, if you did in indeed choose your own magma to go along with me, no matter which magma you chose, you should get that the empty set is a subuniverse of your magma for the exact same reason that I gave. Because here I didn't actually need to use anything special about the multiplication table that I chose. So if you chose a different one, you should still get that the empty set is one of your subuniverses. Okay, that's a little bit of a technicality. If you're not the best set theorist yet, don't uh, worry too much about it, but it is true that the empty set is always gonna be one of your subuniverses. Okay, now let's move on to sort of the first non-trivial thing to look at. Now, if I'm looking at my set X as the singleton set containing A, um, the question is, um, is A, times a um, in the set containing a. OK, and don't worry too much about it, but I'm actually a big fan of the opening question mark as well. I know it's not standard English, but I've always found it very pleasing to have that symmetry. So in any case, is a times a in the set containing a? Well, in my magma, A times A is A, because if I look at A on the left and A on the right, that means A times A is A. And so indeed, this is an element of the set containing just A. It's in fact the only element of that set. So yes. And that means that the set containing A is, in fact, a subuniverse of my magma A. Now, if you chose a different multiplication, um, for example, one where A times A is actually B, then you would find that A times A did not belong to the singleton set A, and you would not have the singleton set A in your collection of subuniverses. So at this point, 
the choices that you made at the beginning for which magma you wanted to look at um, will affect whether or not the singleton set A is a subuniverse. But OK, even if it's not a subuniverse, remember that that's OK, too. Um, all the magmas are kind of special in their own way, just like all the numbers are. Um, just because a number isn't prime or a magma isn't subdirectly irreducible or something else doesn't mean that it's not it's not good in its own way. <laughs> OK, so now we have a similar, a similar question for the singleton set B. Uh, just containing one element B. And so the question now, uh, more succinctly written, is um, is, uh, is BB, in fact, an element? So this question mark over here means, is, is BB an element of the singleton set containing B? Well, again, this answer will differ for you whether or not um, you've made the same choices that I have, um, or it may differ. But in my case, I find that B times B is in fact A. But A is not an element of the singleton set B because I chose A and B to be two different things. It's very important that A and B are two different things because that's how I chose my underlying set. Um, I wanted it to have two elements. so. Um, so A is not is not in the set B. It's a pretty, pretty gnarly, not not contain not an element of sign. All right. So um, B B is A, which is not in the set <laughs> containing just B. And so um, in this case, the answer is is no. And again, remember that that's not you know necessarily good or bad. We don't really have any goals or aspirations for this magma at the moment. We're just checking out what it is. And so in this case, we find out that uh, the singleton B is therefore not in the collection of subuniverses of Phi magma A, because the singleton set B is not closed under multiplication. OK, so these three cases were all pretty straightforward. Now we come to the only somewhat complicated case. In order to check that A, the whole set, is closed under multiplication, well, um, so technically, technically, um, if we wanted to check it directly, we'd have to check that AA, uh, we'd want to know is AA in, in A, is AB in A, is BA in A, and is BB in A. Um, however, we don't really need to do much work to check this because by definition, this multiplication um, F, which I've been suppressing in this notation, well, F of X1, X2 for any X1 and X2 in A is an element of A because F is a function that takes pairs of things in A other things in A. So no matter what I choose, it always ends up in A. And so uh, the answer here is yes. And you'll notice that this answer also only depends on um, the fact that we have a magma, not anything special about the multiplication. So just like with the empty set, no matter which magma you chose, you should also find that the entire universe A is a member of the collection of subuniverses of your magma A. Okay, so now we've checked all possible subsets of our universe to see whether or not they're subuniverses. So, um, okay, so now uh, we can write down. Well, maybe I'll copy down what my magma is again. OK, so here's my magma. It has some multiplication f. I've been calling the magma a. And it has its universe a. 
and its basic operation f, taking pairs of things in A to other things in A, where my universe A is the set of two elements, which I call A and B. Now I found that the collection of subuniverses of my magma A I, consists of the empty set, the singleton set containing just A, and the entire set A, which is again the set containing A and B. So you might have a different list, but your list should always include the empty set and the entire set. Um, but you may or may not have the two singleton sets A and B. So, well, now that I've done this, I can actually draw what's called a Hasse diagram to get a picture of what my uh, subuniverses look like. Because uh, we can order our subuniverses by containment. So, um, so notice that in this case, we have a chain of containments. Um, the empty set is a subset of the singleton set A, which is a subset of the whole set, capital A. And so for a Hasse diagram, I draw the sets that are uh, smaller below the sets which contain them. So empty set lies below the singleton set containing just A. And then the whole set A lies below or lies above the singleton set A. And it's not necessary to draw the, the line showing that the capital A, that the whole universe is above the empty set because um, that's redundant from the information we already have. So note that uh, I'll draw this dotted line to show we did not end up including this other singleton set B, but if you had included, if you had found that for your magma, both the singleton set A and the singleton set B were subuniverses, then you would discover that your Hasse diagram for uh, all of your subuniverses or for the lattice of subuniverses is uh, has this shape. Um, neither A, the singleton A nor the singleton B are above each other because um, neither one contains the other. However, they both contain the empty set and they're both contained in the universe A. Okay, um, and of course, it's also possible that you actually uh, didn't obtain either singleton A or singleton B as uh, subuniverses, in which case your subuniverse lattice would uh, would look like this, and you would just omit those those guys. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's what the subuniverse lattice of your magma is. Um, now, of course, uh, for uh, magmas of order two, there really isn't a lot more that can happen than what I just described. Um, I mean, that's that's pretty pretty much. Uh, pretty much what your subuniverse lattice is going to look like. Um, so uh, notice that when you have a subuniverse, you actually have, um, you can make a smaller magma whose universe is that subuniverse and whose basic operation is, uh, whose multiplication is obtained by just using the multiplication from the original magma. So for instance, um, I have this magma. Uh, here and I have singleton A as a subuniverse. So if I just look at the part of the multiplication table with A on the left and right, then A times A is A, and I get this this magma of order one. And so that would be uh, that would be a subalgebra of the original magma I started with. Now uh, the empty set is sort of a the set theoretic corner case. If you allow empty algebras, then it would be there, the empty magma or the, the back row of zero elements would be uh, the corresponding subalgebra. But that's kind of a technicality. And I'm trying to be chill and not argue <laughs> or not freak out too much. So I'm not going to get too much into it. 
All right, so um, this was just sort of a first experimental thing to see if people uh, would find this entertaining or chill. Um, I know I'm not gonna not gonna reach the level where people want to fall asleep listening to me to algebra because it's it's just you know uh, probably not that shallow. But um, I hope if you did actually sort of come along with me um, and uh, try this out that you had fun. And in the future, I might do more videos where uh, I kind of guide you along um, doing more complicated things. Um, you know, this uh, this one was a pretty small uh, small algebraic structure, but if um, people are really into it, I will kind of sit and like just riff and produce uh, more complicated objects just off the top of my head. And I can't guarantee that we'll prove anything particularly interesting, but I hope that it's at least nice and inspires you to experiment a little bit on your own. Um, all right, well, thanks for checking this out and um, maybe uh, for a fun exercise, try coming up with um, an order three magma with three elements, A, B, uh, A, B, and C, and fill in those nine spots, and then try to figure out what the Hasse diagram of the subuniverse um, lattice of this, of the magma that you come up with looks like. Or maybe I'll do that next time, if there is indeed a next time. All right, well, I guess that's it for my first attempt at playing with magma. Um, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your 2020. <laughs>